We're excited to announce that we wrote a book and it is now available for pre-orders on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and basically any bookstore that you can convince to pre-order it for you. It's called Multi-Amory Essential Tools for Modern Relationships. And this book is a collection of our most popular communication tools compiled with real world examples, worksheets, discussion questions, and more. It's a collection of the tools that we reference the most often. So things like radar or the Triforce of Communication, Repair Shop, Chewers and Spewers. We even have a section on boundaries and even more. So if you have ever wanted to be able to reference or highlight or be able to gift one of those communication tools to someone in your life, this is the best way to do it. You can get links and more information about the book at multiamory.com slash book. Your pre-orders will help this book to get out there in front of more people and maybe even end up on some bestsellers list. So thank you all so much for your help. I hope this is a very validating read for neurodivergent readers because we get a lot of negative messages about any possibility of finding love in this world. The idea that we could not only find love, but be at the center of a grand constellation of love with far more participants than exist in the average monogamous couple is a rather odd idea for so many of us, and I don't think it should be. So a great deal of this book is uh, devoted to making, to challenging that, to making sure that neurodivergent readers understand that not only is a polyamorous existence possible for us, but it can work better for us than the alternative. Welcome to the Multi-Amory Podcast. I'm Jace. I'm Emily. And I'm Dedeker. We believe in looking to the future of relationships, not maintaining the status quo of the past. So whether you're monogamous, polyamorous, swinging, casually dating, or if you just do relationships differently, we see you and we're here for you. On this episode of the Multi-Amory Podcast, we're talking about non-monogamy and neurodiversity with author Alyssa Gonzalez. Alyssa Mm -hmm. is a biology PhD speaker and writer. Her blog, The Perfumed Void, explores the subjects of biology, history, and her experiences as an autistic, ex-Catholic, Hispanic, transgender immigrant to Canada. She is the author of Non-Monogamy and Neurodiversity, which just came out in February, and explores polyamory from a neurodivergent perspective. Alyssa, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Uh, It's an honor, a privilege, and a delight to be here. Oh, gosh, all three at once. I feel like we could have a whole nother talk about the ex-Catholic part. We have another (laughs) show called Drunk Bible Study, where we talk about the Bible and a lot of different things and ex-evangelicalism and stuff like that. So That sounds like a lot of fun. (laughs) <laughs> it's, it's basically, I mean, at least for myself, that's how I work out my own religious PTSD. But again, mm-hmm. that's a mm-hmm. conversation for a whole other time. So, Alyssa, we've had many different neurodivergent guests on the show, both people who openly identify that way, people who mm-hmm. identify using different terms. And the term neurodivergent covers or seems to cover a really wide spectrum. It seems to have many different definitions and applications, sometimes depending on who you talk to. Can you explain what you mean when you say neurodivergent? I aimed to cover as much of the grand spectrum of neurological difference as I could speak to informedly in this book. People who've read it have already told me some spaces I missed. Sorry about that. Of course. The official definition of this term is essentially any nameable or even unnameable difference from the the neurotypical baseline. And so it ranges from obvious inclusions like autism to maybe a lot less obvious ones like depression. And because it's such a big term, it often changes a lot between different users. And I, I've tried to, I've aimed it as at a variety of mental states that usually are things that once a person has them, they can expect to keep having them. Like they're not things people grow out of or cure. Most of them aren't even diseases. So I've thought about it as this shared community of people who see how the the mainstream works from a the brain function perspective and think that does not fit me 
Yeah, I'm wondering, do you have examples of some of the most obvious things that would stand out to someone as like, oh, that doesn't fit me? In my own perspective is coming at this as an autistic person. And big, big one for me is many situations I will come to a person with a matter of fact statement and they will immediately digest it in their head into a dense flurry of nonsense because they don't hear matter of fact statements. They hear statements that are prefaced by a whole bunch of additional content about what my relationship to them is and what subtext I might be trying to deliver about what, where our relationship stands and what, how it might change in relation to what action they take based on what I just told them and all this other stuff. And very often I'm literally just telling them that, that there's a thing in the sink or the plumber's going to be here soon or whatever. Right. So you can see how this can complicate relationships. Exactly. Hmm. So that's that's one thing that can come up a lot that tends to reinforce to people whose brains work like mine that the rest of the world does not work like my brain does. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about the process of writing the book? I guess maybe start from what inspired you to write this book. Well, being approached by the publisher was a very good start. <laughs> it's very inspiring. Uh, that is Excellent. Great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think part of it is in I have it the intersection of the the words on either side of and in the title, and so I've had to confront a lot of realities about existing in both of these spaces as a result of existing in both of these spaces and being a reasonably clever and observant person. I like to think I noticed a lot of stuff both made this life more challenging for me, but also made it feel like I c couldn't possibly be any other way. Like the things that make me brain weird, so to speak, also make me and others like me unusually well suited to the demands of being polyamorous. And it didn't feel like this insight was already out there and laid out in the way that felt sensible to me. So this was my opportunity to get this perspective into people's hands. And it felt important to do that. Now, you mentioned earlier that after already having published the book, already some people have reached out to you to say like, oh, you missed this or you missed that. Mm -hmm. And this seems like it might present a unique challenge in in that overlapping identity, right? Where you said that, mm -hmm. you know, neurodivergence covers this huge spectrum of different ways that that presents and shows up for people. And at the same time, the practice of non-monogamy also covers this huge spectrum of how people interpret that and practice that. And it seems like it's just setting up for inevitably someone would be like, wait, but you forgot about X, Y, and Z. I mean, how, how did you, how did you tackle that without writing like a 6,000 page book? <laughs> I mean, having a hard word count to start with meant I had to prioritize <laughs> very hard. And on top of stuff that I missed simply because I did not have the fullness of this entire topic in my brain at the time, there's stuff that I had to cover more briefly than someone else might have in a more focused book. And the big thing I tried to do is that the names that are given to the various forms of neurodivergence are the products of their time and place. Asperger syndrome is a big one that is no longer considered a valid diagnosis. People that received that diagnosis can call themselves whatever they want, but it's been folded diagnostically into the autism spectrum. It is no longer given as its own thing. But those people still exist. Right? The reasons that they got a diagnosis still happen to them. So I tried to sort this in particular based on like, the reasons that someone might read this book. Like, the fact things mm. about themselves that might cause them to recognize themselves as neurodivergent or that might present as challenges or opportunities within non-monogamy. I also find that ADHD and autism overlap a lot. I don't think science is done nailing down the lines between these yet. So lots of things get listed in online resources as you know, ADHD experiences that feel autistic to me and vice versa, or only seem to happen when people feel both of those words apply. And it's just that morass is, would have been utterly pointless for me to d dive into directly in this book because it's... Sure. This is it would not have been useful to categorize it like this is the ADHD section and this is the borderline mm. section and so on. That's not why people come to a book like this. There are challenges and experiences that are individual that might lead someone to get one of these names, but that aren't the essence of them. So I sorted it with these symptoms and not diagnoses in mind, so to speak. Yeah. To go along with that, could you okay. maybe tell our listeners a little bit about 
what they could expect from the book if they go pick it up, which I'm sure they're all rushing to go (laughs) order it right now. But is this more of an intellectual exploration of these topics? Is it more practical advice? You know, what can people look forward to with the book? There's plenty of practical advice in here, albeit brief. A lot of it will feel to readers more like these are the kinds of things you can look for in much greater detail than I could have covered somewhere else. I hope this is a very validating read for neurodivergent readers because we get a lot of negative messages about any possibility of finding love in this world. The idea that we could not only find love, but be at the center of a grand constellation of love with far more participants than exist in the average monogamous couple is a rather odd idea for so many of us, and I don't think it should be. So a great deal of this book is uh, devoted to making, to challenging that, to making sure that neurodivergent readers understand that not only is a polyamorous existence possible for us, but it can work better for us than the alternative. There's personal backgrounds in here about the perspective that I come to this topic from and how I've lived the realities it discusses. Uh, I endeavor for people who read this to come out fully convinced that even if it's not necessarily the right life for them, that it's a life that a lot of us can have great success in and can be well suited to. And that it's also a not something that is challenge-free and that there are potential areas of difficulty and there are resources for dealing with those. So practical advice, memoir, just the exercise and validation, all of the above. So we are going to dive into, you know, the specific areas that you highlight as like ways that non-monogamy may be easier for neurodivergent mm-hmm. folks versus the areas where it may be more difficult. But I first wanted to talk a little bit about the landscape mm-hmm. that I know from my perspective, especially Mm -hmm. since I started working with clients individually five, six, seven years ago, whatever it was, that, yeah, there's a lot of neurodivergent people within the non-monogamous community. Mm -hmm. Like that Venn diagram overlaps a surprising amount. And our researcher, M, who worked on this episode, dropped in our show notes this really interesting research study that showed that autistic individuals specifically were more likely to report being non-monogamous or open Mm. to non-monogamy compared to a neurotypical control group. Now, I mean, that's just one flavor of it, right? Like we don't have that same research study for, you know, people who are ADHD. And and like you said, like some of that gets a little bit difficult because these the lines on these things are starting to get a little bit fuzzy. But I was wondering, you know, from your armchair sociologist slash actual biologist perspective, why do you think that we see so many people who are neurodivergent being drawn to non-monogamy? I find there's a sort of magnetism of strangeness that neurodivergent people uh, inhabit almost continuously. The things that are normal often don't make sense to us, and people that feel okay about normal get very defensive about that fact. Mm -hmm. And once we're at a point where just the basic realities of existing in a space whose rules they got to decide, it doesn't fit. Like once it's it's very easy to start looking around for alternatives that actually do feel right and mesh with us. And it comes very naturally to neurodivergent people, especially autistic people. But I think this is a broader experience that once normal it extensively demonstrates that it's not for us, it's hard to feel beholden to it anymore. Right? Mm. People might accede to whatever amount of peer pressure they have to in order to function in society, but actually feeling invested in it, putting effort into uh, sticking with norms that don't make sense and don't fit, we are a lot less likely to do that than neurotypical people, I think. So alternative lifestyles of basically every sort are absolutely chock full of neurodivergent people. In addition to not being terribly invested in a normal that is not serving us, we're much Mm -hmm. more likely to encounter a weird thing and think, yes, this feels amazing, and not, that's weird. They're going to think I'm weird if I do the weird thing. Normal wasn't prepared to treat us kindly in the first place. We have no reason to spend our time with it. That's funny, because I I feel like five or six years ago, (laughs) reading an article that somebody wrote, making a very similar argument about Uh why there's such an overlap between geek culture and polyamorous culture or Uh non-monogamous culture, and really basically identical argument that, like, once you've already found a way to live relatively comfortable outside of normal, it's not quite as scary with other quote unquote, not normal 
things. Exactly. There are so many things that get defended just because it's it's what's ordinary. It's the way things have always, except not really, have been done. It's, it's, it's standard. It's a heuristic. It's easy because we can rely on a whole pile of assumptions going in. But a lot of neurodivergent people just almost literally did not get the memo on those assumptions. It doesn't fit. It doesn't feel right. And, and it's just... And once you're not adhering to any of that, it's it's very easy to just keep poking and looking and continuing to craft a reality that feels a lot better, even if it's profoundly strange by anyone else's perspective. So you alluded to this a little bit before, and also you discuss it in your book, but you talk about the fact that there are traits that those who are neurodivergent have that Uh make non-monogamy potentially easier in some ways. Uh Can you discuss what some of those traits might be? probably the top of the list since we can probably retitle every podcast about relationships communication and it'd be accurate (laughs) is a a lot of us have a variety of traits and how we communicate that are helpful when conversations can get tense and emotional and can no longer rely on obvious heuristics as shortcuts. You said you were very direct and that makes a lot of sense to me that being direct would be something that would be very helpful in a lot of situations so that you don't have uh-huh. to think about all of what's going on internally, the minutia, but more just uh-huh. this is what it is and I'm telling it to you straight. Exactly. And it's not even just for autistic people necessarily, although they're probably the most overrepresented group that sees the word neurodivergent and thinks, yes, me. It's like if someone is dealing with the CPTSD or something that... There can be very different reactions to emotional topics that lead to a different approach to communication that can be useful when the topic is tense and so on. I necessarily expect someone who is actively suffering to also be a very effective communicator, but the same tools that can help someone who has that condition can be very helpful when someone is having a conversation where a lot of old heuristics don't apply. As you were talking about that, Uh what came to mind for me was... I could see an appeal of this is a way of doing relationships Mm -hmm. where more explicit communication is front and center. That Mm -hmm. makes sense to me. So I want to do more of that. But I can also Mm -hmm. see that being in a way you're entering a type of relationship where the people who are doing it are really trying to learn to be more clear in their communication. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like by dating in polyamorous, non-monogamous spaces, you might be more likely to find neurotypical people who've done the work to try to be more explicit in their communication in a way that they might not have otherwise done if they were allowed to follow a lot of the defaults. I expect so. It's almost like you have a better pool that way. Can't confirm dating pool is much, much better for me. (laughs) Yeah, it's funny. In my practice, I, you know, I would say the people that I work with, probably like 95% non-monogamous or some flavor of relationship Uh weirdo. But I do get the occasional person who, you know, knows that they're monogamous and it's not necessarily default monogamy. They're like, yeah, I've tried a bunch of different relationship styles Uh and and I know that I want to be monogamous, but I want to not play games. I want to communicate honestly Mm -hmm. with people. I want to sit down, you know, by our second date or third date and have a clear sense of like, what are we both interested in? Those are the people that I find have a lot of frustration because it's like Jay said, it's like they're, they're trying on this other way of being so explicit and matter of fact and front and center with communication, but still dating in a very like traditional kind of playing by default mostly monogamous dating pool and and it's like that's when i see like this biggest culture clash taking place one of my dreams is for people like that to learn and memorize the phrase polysaturated at one yeah yeah once people start talking like that i I don't think that the actual social institution that is monogamy really has a hold on them anymore fascinating even if they don't feel capable of sustaining more than one relationship I love that idea. (laughs) Like that, (laughs) just that you can take all of the amazing Mm -hmm. things about polyamory and Mm -hmm. kind of wrap it in monogamy to a degree, but it's not. It's Mm -hmm. like going past that and and going further, especially with communication practices being as specific and explicit as they Mm -hmm. need to be in non monogamy. That's really cool. I actually was just having a conversation with my hairstylist, with my barber Mm -hmm. this morning. (laughs) 
because I was, you know, she asked what I was doing with the rest of my day. I said, oh, I'm recording a couple of podcast episodes. And so she asked what, you know, what's it about? And I explained Perfect. some things and she was asking questions. And I mentioned how I haven't had any long-term relationships since the end of 2019. Perfect. And so the response she gives, which is pretty common one I get, is that, oh, Perfect. so you're essentially monogamous. Besides Dedeker, Yes. So. Right. They're like, oh, you're essentially monogamous right now. And my response is like, uh -huh. I guess, but I don't feel that way because that's not how uh -huh. I'm thinking about the relationship and not how I approach it. And, you know, sure, I've been on a couple dates in the last few years, yeah. but it's that it's different, though. It is almost maybe more like I'm polysaturated at one uh -huh. rather than it being monogamous. Like there's just a different feel to how I would be thinking about the relationship. Right. Like once a person is prepared to not go on some kind of fiery rampage when their partner starts dating someone else, that I don't think monogamy is the right word for that anymore. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah interesting rubric. Interesting rubric. Um, yeah, I, I had to think about that a lot uh -huh. because I spent, uh -huh. like, so I had a big breakup at the beginning of 2022 and basically spent, yeah, about a year in that quote unquote, essentially monogamous phase and like okay. really grappled with that a lot of, mm. but I'm not monogamous. Again, like the way okay. that I think about it, or like the conversations that you and I had, Jace, but talking about people who are hot, right? Or like, <laughs> and or like what we're thinking about the next time we're starting dating again. Again, all these things that to me don't read as like typical okay. monogamy, but it's, I don't know, it's so funny how language starts to collapse and become less useful <laughs> in that regard. Okay. And uh, that was one of the big things for me that feel was an, a great opportunity for me once I realized non-monogamy was an option that was a tremendous challenge before then because it was one of those very normal things I could not wrap my head around, which is just... I grew up in the Cuban-American community in Miami, and bombastic displays of jealousy are the sixth Cuban-American love language. Oh boy, <laughs> goodness. <laughs> and that was just not something I was able to give anyone I dated in mm. high school. Because as mm. long as the time that I was actually spending with the person was continuing to fulfill me, I did not care what else they were up to. And it mm. felt weird that whatever else I was up to mattered t to them. And I could just utterly could not wrap my head around it. To this day, it's something that I file in the weird stuff the neurotypicals do in my brain. Just could not fathom that the something I did when they weren't even in the room that didn't affect them or have some indication that I had some awful value as a person or whatever it would somehow jeopardize the relationship. Utterly alien to my psychology. And I think feelings like that are a lot more common in the neurodivergent space than anywhere else even. Hmm. Just this sense that things can be relatively neatly compartmentalized that way that relationships are simply are what they are and that don't necessarily and it doesn't necessarily change all my other relationships if I you know, meet a new friend on the bus or start kissing this person that I've already been talking to for a long time or anything like that it is in the polyamorous space and in particular neurodivergent spaces I find that this perspective feels most comprehensible to anyone besides me well so to back it up and talk about other things other baffling behavior that neurotypical uh -huh. people do. So uh -huh. I, I want to talk about flirting, which you do spend some time talking about in your uh -huh. book. And now what blew my mind and also was a great uh -huh. comfort to me is you mentioned that it's scientifically established that actually most human beings are bad at figuring out when other people are uh -huh. flirting. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Uh -huh. The, the study I read was flat out worse than 50% odds. Like, it would have been better if everyone wow. just inverted their diagnosis of the other person's behavior. <laughs> what? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> like, still not good, but better than what they were doing. Was this about someone evaluating if they themselves were being flirted with or yeah. watching two other people and guessing if they're flirting uh, or not? Evaluating other people's interactions with them, I believe, was the study. Wow, worse than 50%. That makes sense to me that they're really bad at it. Yeah, I feel like I'm bad at it. I'm and I'm assuming that this means, I guess, the classic problem that I guess all of <laughs> us have, which is, are they flirting with me or are they being friendly? That, <laughs> that basically, that's the marker where people across the board just cannot tell the difference. Yeah. <laughs> and there's all these stereotypes in the lesbian community that 
Uh, oh, she's just so nice. Uh, <laughs> we moved in together six months ago. Is this a date? <laughs> <laughs> yeah so okay. how do you find that showing up you know because especially in non-monogamous spaces there's a lot of complicating factors at play right you know mm-hmm. not only do we have the fact that a lot in a lot of non-monogamous spaces there's a lot of neurodivergent people who maybe interpret flirting slash friendliness in different ways mm-hmm. combined with in non-monogamous spaces there is often a little bit of this weird kind of, well, is everyone technically available? Like, or are these people being nice or is it, you no. know? So I guess I'm kind of wondering, like, how do you see people rectifying that, working through that? What are the main challenges that, you, that you've that you noticed? And everyone's got their own solution there. And mm-hmm. I, I find in practice, if someone is being very oblique and passive and I don't have some other reason to be invested in whatever they have going on it's very easy to just sort of let them do that and if they want something from me they can figure out a more effective way to get it or not <laughs> mm. so you mean someone who's being like mysterious and and uh-huh. I don't know I guess the the stereotypical quote-unquote like hard to get sort of approach uh-huh. exactly like I've I've got lots of things. If the thing is hard to get, it better be friggin' worth it. And if it's being hard to get right from the start, I don't know that yet. So they're gonna need another strategy. Right. But uh, more than that, like I find if there's ambiguity, I can ask. And if the other person is neurodivergent enough, they'll appreciate me resolving the ambiguity for them by asking. Which is another thing that the neurotypicals should really get on. If I step up how overt my behavior is and step with theirs usually goes pretty well for me. Sometimes I actually have to tell someone I'm not interested, but usually I can just not respond to whatever they're doing and they'll get bored and leave. Uh, But this is all deeply complicated by all sorts of other intersections. I think men have a very different experience of all of this than I do, especially men who are conscientious about how women sometimes react to people larger than them trying to get intimate. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely something we've talked about on the show before. Yeah, the the flirting thing is interesting and also a little concerning Mm -hmm. because something that I was just talking about recently, Mm -hmm. I think a couple episodes ago, is about being out as non-monogamous in the workplace Mm -hmm. and how that's Mm -hmm. an area where I try to be extra careful to basically Mm -hmm. come across as a completely non-sexual person at work because Mm -hmm. I don't want someone to interpret my non-monogamy as meaning, oh, I'm on the, the hunt all the time. And I'm especially aware of that as a man, because there is that, like, if anyone thinks that that's where I'm coming from, even if it's because of nothing I've done. And now that I know how badly people evaluate whether someone's flirting or not, I'm like, oh, gosh, I got to step up my game in that area. And if you haven't been called into HR or had coworkers mysteriously disappear, you're probably fine. (laughs) Gosh. <laughs> well, thanks. Yeah, I think I've been doing okay so far, but it well, is but Jace, okay, but but if what the science says is like people are just like really bad at, at interpreting whether it's flirting or friendliness, how do you step up your game there? Become also like a completely non-social, non-friendly kind of person, <laughs> just zero human interaction. That's, no yeah, smiling. I think I think that's probably probably the way to go. Yeah, <laughs> and I know one area that where ambiguity seems to especially crop up is casual physical touch especially when there's a bit of a culture clash happening there and someone from a very touchy culture suddenly deals with the, all the closed off northern european descended folks in this part of the world mm. doesn't have to be that way and honestly a nice trick is to just assume the other person is not flirting unless you're receptive and then they have that just have that be the first step in your hur- heuristic. If you're not interested, they're not flirting, period. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they can try to get through that I- if they want. But I find that that tends to dissuade people pretty fast. So in your book, you also mentioned that a lot of neurodivergent people value independence and autonomy. And that this may be something that helps make something like non-monogamy a little bit easier. And it is interesting because I do think when I think about quote unquote non-monogamy <laughs> culture, independence and autonomy feels like one of the many pillars of non-monogamy culture. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Uh, definitely. It's one of the sort of foundational experiences of being a neurodivergent person is having our perspectives consistently minimized in popular spaces. 
we're weird and they're not. And therefore, if there's there's some manner of disagreement or difference of interpretation or difference of emphasis, even it's the default that we have to figure out how they work. But then figuring us out is optional at best. That if if there's a space whose rules are still being decided and we see them one way and they see them another way, we're, we're lucky if they acknowledge that we said anything at all, let alone allow any part of the space to not work the way they want it to. The result is that a lot of us just aren't used to the things we want mattering to other people. We all have stories about you know, the state of the spaces we control being under constant scrutiny by you know, neurotypical parents and teachers, you know, people deciding that notes aren't allowed to be messy or whatever, even if it works for the person who's taking them, because I don't know. This it results in a lot of us growing up and not really experiencing until we are stuck living in you know, one room studio apartment somewhere as students. It's like, that's when we finally actually have control over the circumstances of our lives in any way that matters. And that can be a very hard thing to give up in a standard relationship escalator monogamist model where one of the steps is you merge households with the other person at some point and suddenly their thoughts on how the space you live in is supposed to be organized have to matter or else they're just moving into your space and that's not fair to them either. Like, this is can be very challenging to navigate because it can feel like losing all of that hard-won autonomy all over again. And not to say that you know, people like me don't have successfully cohabitate, it's more that this is part of the challenge of that kind of life. And certainly it can decide not to cohabitate or to have a designated space that is just yours in a relationship that happens to have only two people in it and so on. Like all of it is possible to navigate without opening a relationship. But in a model where every detail has to be individually hashed out because none of the old heuristics apply, this is a much easier conversation to have. In a model where there's multiple people that are supposed to have equal claims on a person's heart, it's a lot easier to justify not living with any of them because living with all of them would be a lot more logistically challenging. And they might have their own things going on. And it's just, it, it feels a, a lot easier to handle a, as a neurodivergent person than I think it would otherwise, because of all this intersecting, all these intersecting factors that end up coming into play here. Yeah, I think kind of to go with the explicit okay. communication thing that mm -hmm. culturally within non-monogamy there's more of an understanding that mm -hmm. we're not going to assume our living structure is going to mm -hmm. look one way and that it's something that will be discussed whatever we end up deciding so that that does make sense that just even <laughs> knowing that i'm going to be talking to people who realize there are options and there's other ways this might look makes a lot of sense yeah. it's also a nice cover if you're kind of avoidant and traumatized and doing your level best to save polysecure for later in your reading list. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's the second time I've heard that this week. <laughs> yeah. Like, not yet. Later. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. We're going to go on to talk about mm -hmm. some of the challenges that come up with neurodivergence and polyamory. Mm -hmm. But first, we're going to take a quick break to talk about some ways that you can support this show if you appreciate this kind of content getting out there for free and want to help spread the word and keep this going for everybody out there, take a moment to check out our sponsors, if any seem interesting to you, and to join our communities. We'd love to have you there. I recall a time in my young life where I felt, you know, I, I'm young. I don't need lubrication. Ugh. I have it already. Ugh. It's not a thing that I need to add to my sex life. How wrong I was. The mistake we all make in our 20s. It's not true, everyone. You do need lubrication. And if you're going to have it, you might as well have the best out there. And that is Uber Lube. Sex is just better with lube. And if you're going to use lube, use something that's good quality, which is why we love Uber Lube so much. It doesn't leave a residue. It doesn't stain your sheets or your clothing. It doesn't have a smell or a taste, which personally is a big thing for me. I really don't like the smell of a lot of lubes, but I like Uber Lube because it doesn't have that. And it has this more natural feel to it. You're feeling the other person's skin or even your own skin, but just a little more lubricated version of it. And you'll have a great time because you are in control of how long it lasts. Uber Lube offers long lasting performance when you want it, but also quickly dissipates without leaving a sticky residue and just kind of feels like a nice moisturizer when you're finished. 
Also, for people who have sensitivities to certain lubricants that are water-based, it's because they absorb into the bloodstream. So if you have a bad reaction to them, that might be why. But UberLube does not. And so people with sensitive skin often find UberLube is the answer to their lubrication prayers. Right now, UberLube is offering Multi-Amory listeners a special offer of 10% off and free shipping when you use our code MultiAmory at UberLube.com. That's 10% off and free shipping. Just use our code MultiAmory at U-B-E-R-L-U-B-E dot com. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. I've been working with my therapist through BetterHelp for several months now. I just switched to one somewhat recently, a few months ago, and it's been great. And one of the things that he really helped me discover about myself is some areas specifically around music performance, actually, where I was feeling a lot of kind of feelings of I'm kind of taking up time or, or people probably don't want to hear that. And something that he really helped me uncover was that those are just parts of myself that have always been there. And maybe not everybody likes my music or isn't in the mood to hear it, but that that shouldn't get in the way of me expressing myself and doing something that feels true and important for me, because there are also people out there who probably love it. I've talked a lot on this show about how long it took me to go to therapy. And one of the big reasons for that is kind of the barrier to entry that often is in traditional therapy models. You have to call up your insurance company. You have to see who out there is even accepting patients. And many of them may not call you back or just simply reject your offer to be their patient. <laughs> and that's really tough. It, it just causes, I think, a lot of people, and it did me for years, to not even want to go there, not even want to try. But therapy is a hugely beneficial thing. And getting to have my therapist from BetterHelp every week for the last six months has been just incredible for me. I love the fact that she's always checking in with me almost on a daily basis. It's really lovely to know that somebody is there for me. And she helps me feel like I can call upon her if I really need it. And they make it super easy. You just fill out a questionnaire, you get matched with a licensed therapist, and then you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge if it's not a good fit. So it's time for you to discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash multi today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash multi. I was going for a walk the other day and I saw popping out of the snow, the first signs of spring. No, really, though, that's not an overstatement. Wait, you have snow? No, just let me finish my story. I love okay, plants. Okay. And so at this time of year, when they, they're they just starting to put out little buds, and I'm just like, oh, my God, finally, finally, I can come out of my snow cave. Finally, I can look forward to the days where I'm not putting on six layers of clothing. And for me, it's a time where I'm like, wow, I am a live sexual being <laughs> who maybe is interested in dating. That's what I think. I don't know. I kind of tend to shut down in the winter time. But anyway, if you're also like me and you're noticing the signs of spring and you're having a spring awakening within yourself as well, we highly recommend that you check out our sponsor for this week's episode, Field. I don't know how I can continue after that amazing <laughs> intro with poetry and everything. Field is the largest dating community of progressive people across the globe. It connects the curious and the open-minded and has built a community for ethical and honest people to share what it is they're looking for and to create a world where you can be more upfront and honest about what you're looking for, whether that's long walks on the beach. I mean, it's very cold on the beach. I did actually go for a long walk on the beach, though, just the other day, and it was quite nice with six layers on, like Dedeker said. But, you know, whether it's long walks on the beach or finding friendship or something kinky or wanting to have group play or threesomes or whatever it is, you're able to be honest and upfront about that. And that includes things like your gender and sexual orientation. There's more than 20 different gender and sexuality options to choose from in the app so that you can actually express yourself. For a limited time, listeners will receive a free month of Field's Majestic membership when they download the app for the first time. Just use the link in the show notes to download Field. That's F-E-E-L-D for free and get access to your free month of Majestic membership. Hey, this is Courtney Kosak from Private Parts Unknown, and I want to tell you about an amazing sponsor of the Pleasure Podcast Network called Athena Club. I am getting back into the groove of shaving now that the weather is getting nicer and winter is almost over, thank God, but... 
There is no better razor out there than the Athena Club razor. Shaving used to be something I dreaded, still is, but Athena Club's products seriously make it fun and easy to shave. And I am not the only one who feels that way because Athena Club's razor has thousands of five-star reviews from customers and it's designed with built-in skin guards to help prevent razor burn while being gentle on the curves. Plus, the razor blade is surrounded by a water-activated serum with shea butter and hyaluronic acid, which is the holy grail for skincare. And the best part is the razor kit is only $10 and it comes with two blade heads, a magnetic hook for shower storage, and your choice of handle color. Show your skin you care with the Athena Club razor kit. Head to athenaclub.com and use code PLEASURE for 25% off your first order. Again, that is athenaclub.com and use code PLEASURE for 25% off. Athena Club has also launched in Target stores nationwide, so make sure to check out the shaving aisle to buy their products in store in real life. And one more time, head to athenaclub.com and use that code PLEASURE. You can thank me later. And we're back. So additionally in the book, kind of on the flip side of things that we were just discussing there, can you talk a little bit about the aspects of neurodivergence that could make polyamory more difficult, specifically things like rejection, sensitivity, dysphoria, alexithymia, and stigma, things along those lines? Uh, Absolutely. For all that, I think non-monogamy and neurodiversity are a match made in whatever place put peanut butter and jam together. (laughs) <laughs> it, it's, it's definitely not all sunshine and roses and in any environment where people are doing a lot of potentially tense interpersonal interaction any challenges a person faces there can become magnified so for someone who deals with alexithymia and has trouble identifying other people's emotions or especially their own I, Conversations that deal with difficult emotions become a lot more difficult. So for people who react very strongly to any sensation of rejection and have brains that reach immediately to the idea that this is a wholesale referendum on their value as a human being, right? continuing to flirt with new people after you found your first one is is a especially fraught experience. Mm-hmm. And entering into challenging relationship dynamics that can create a variety of new and unexpected emotions can also be quite challenging. So both of these situations can greatly complicate even ordinary life for a person that isn't transgressing any especially exciting cultural norms. Mm -hmm. But in an environment where you're already doing things that heuristics don't apply to and that involve a lot of emotions, uh, It is especially important and helpful for a person to try to get a handle on those. The challenge that uh, doesn't get enough attention in my experience, especially compared to those, is the idea that sometimes even for neurodivergent people, societal heuristics can be comforting. For a lot of us, the general way that normal society operates can be deeply unintuitive, even confusing. There can be things that are very difficult for us to wrap our heads around. In an environment like that, when someone gives us a nice, tidy definition, such as when you're in a romantic relationship, you do these things with that person. And if you do these things with that person, that means this is a romantic relationship. And when you're in a romantic relationship, if they do these other things, that means they don't want to be in it anymore and so on. Like, It's this large series of definitions where if the world is very fuzzy and confusing in your mind, having nice, tidy definitions to lean on is can be very comforting. It's same as someone who's just learning a field of math for the first time. And be it, like, the, what the function does near infinity is what you call its limit. It's like what the function does at very high numbers is what you can call its limit. And you can recite that to yourself over and over again while you're in your calculus one course trying to figure out the rest. And like, yeah, it doesn't completely apply. There's lots of asterisks. There's a whole course and then calculus too after that. But in its place, it can be very comforting. And part of the point of not being monogamous is that you're going to deconstruct all of this and rebuild something brand new for yourself. And while you're busy taking everything apart that you previously understood, you're left with very little to work with. And that can be frightening. That can create a situation where you don't actually know what it makes sense to expect from other people. 
and for a community that gets taken advantage of, mistreated, and psychologically abused as often as ours, an environment where you have no idea what the correct way to do things is supposed to look like, like that, that can be frightening and that can have some really unpleasant consequences. Yeah, I I know we've we talked about this Does ages it? and ages ago, but I do think that's like sort of the weird way that non-monogamy can really open already vulnerable people, open them to more opportunities to be misused and abused because of the fact that so many of us are, okay. you know, some of it is flying by the seat of your pants, right? Some of this is like we're mm-hmm. figuring it out as we go along. Like we end up in a situation where like I didn't receive any social scripts for figuring this out. I don't know Person. how to have a conversation with my partner about, you know, the safe sex practices that I have with somebody else. Like, I, I you know, like we end up in so many situations mm-hmm. where we're all trying to figure it out. And if someone comes in to say, well, I've got it figured out, you just do this. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. like I've been non-monogamous for 10 years. This is what you're supposed mm-hmm. to do. And I know how to do it right. And you don't know how to do it right. So if you just follow what I say, then it's going to be okay. That, mm-hmm. yeah, there is that sort of like if someone comes in with just enough confidence and maybe a not great motive or a not great sense of self-awareness <laughs> that, yeah, it can it can create, I think, really devastating consequences in relationship. Oh, yes. There is so much room for bad actors to say, actually, even though I'm never on time for your dates, but I'm always on time for my dates with this other person, the fact that you're getting jealous of them means you're doing something wrong and right. uh, nonsense yeah, yeah. like that. And person has to have a really strong sense of what the correct way to do things is supposed to be, at least in relation to them, in order to properly fight back against this kind of thing. And when you're midway through deconstructing everything you thought was correct before, that that's, can be a very tricky time. Yeah, I've seen that. I've seen people use that against themselves, kind of, mm-hmm. as well. Either meaning, okay, I found something that seems true and I've kind of made a heuristic out of it, right? I've made a rule that I kind of live by or think that I should do relationships by because this made sense in one context, Mm -hmm. but then in another, it doesn't. I mean, your your jealousy example is a good one there of, Mm -hmm. oh, I was feeling all this jealousy before that was my own thing to deal with. And Mm -hmm. it was just because I was doing something different than I was used to. But then you're in a situation where maybe that jealousy does make sense and that is justified and that is motivated, but Mm -hmm. you already came up with that heuristic. And that's a difficult thing for people to figure out what's that balance between, okay, I've got to figure out some new models of what good and bad looks like so that I at least have a sense of, is this a really shitty situation I'm in or is this okay? And I'm just having a hard time balancing that with, the fact that every situation is different. That is such a mm-hmm. challenge. Exactly. And especially for people like us, where there's a long list of contradictory stereotypes we get subjected to, depending on how we're making the other person feel. Uh, standing up for oneself in an environment like that can be difficult because there's there's always a stereotype ready for whether we're the doormat or, the, or not. And it just it's a lot to deal with and is... If one is dealing with a person where assuming good faith no longer seems appropriate, that can be a hard situation to be in and a hard one to get out of. And just it's important to me that people don't get to the end of this book and think everything is easy and that they don't get to the end and think everything is impossibly hard, but emerge with the reasonably clear impression of what it can be like and the fact that it's both possible and can be wonderful if, if things line up. Well, so while we're on this subject, I, I think this falls in line with a question that we get all the time. And, and I think it is because there's so many neurodivergent people in the non-monogamous community. You, so usually this question comes from the neurotypical person who is in a relationship with a neurodivergent person. And it's usually some version of what are the reasonable accommodations to make for my partner versus what is tolerating bad behavior or bad treatment or neglecting my own needs and boundaries. And of course, that's a situation where it's going to depend on what's actually going on in the relationship. But I guess I was wondering if you have any insight about that, especially because seriously, it's a question we get all the freaking time. Uh in much depends on which difficulties a person is creating and whether it feels like they're making an even slightly comparable effort to meet the other partner where they are. Uh, it is very easy for neurotypical people to 
just trample all over neurodivergent needs. That's society's default towards people like us. In this space, I think there's a very different impulse, precisely because non-monogamy tends to be full of people who at least try to be conscientious about the interpersonal difficulties and are aware of some of these other issues and try to lean the other way. And it is very easy for someone who is marginalized to try to wield that in really unhealthy interpersonal ways. So this, this can go in every direction, and that makes it all the more complicated to sort out. I can't really tell anyone that what treatment is, is going to work because there's so many variables from what access need we're talking about to what accommodations have already been discussed to what consequences are currently unfolding as a result of however this has been un attempted before. But the, to use a common one, if your partner is ADHD and has a lot of trouble being on time for things, some things are more forgiving about being late than others. Like sometimes there are built-in consequences for screwing this up that that person is effectively inflicting on their partner by constantly being late for stuff. And if they don't care about that, that that's a problem, regardless of how forgiving one is inclined to be of them having neurology that is relevant. But on the other hand, like you can alert someone early that a thing is coming up that they have to be on time for. You can figure out how early is uselessly early and not give your reminder then. Like There are ways for people to meet each other where they are in these matters. And it won't always work because humans are awful chaotic creatures that refuse to have the digital precision I wish they did. Uh, and others, like I get very particular about this my schedule at home and I get squirrely when I can't clean at the specific schedule that I want to clean on. I have learned that sometimes I have to skip a weekend because people insisted on putting things on both days in the dang weekends and I can't spend one of them <laughs> dealing with all the cat hair in here. In general, I find neurodivergent people are used to accommodating neurotypical people because that is what this world assumes and there are so many more of them and we went ahead and let them make all the rules for some bloody reason. <laughs> <laughs> but in a relationship, it, it has to go both ways. I'd be lying if I said I was perfect at that, even though I just wrote a book about relationships. But... <laughs> oh, but clearly writing a book about relationships makes you perfect yeah. at them. Uh, exactly. That's what everyone exactly. should know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a total lie. <laughs> We're not either. I guess I, I was curious for yourself, is it easier to date people who are also neurodi neurodivergent just simply because you're coming from a shared to a degree set of experience. I think I have to go three or four layers of metamorphs deep before I find sure. a neurotypical person in my extended Just polycule. Got it. Mm. Got it. I, I have never had dating success with, with, with a neurotypical person. Mm -hmm. We tend to figure out that within about 15 minutes of meeting each other that it is not going to work. We can tell and the other person's just on the wrong wavelength, so to speak. Like, I am amazed that anyone makes that combination work. Kind of an extension of that, you mentioned in your book the stigma and tropes that exist uh -huh. around neurodivergence and the way that you see those things showing up in non-monogamous spaces. So uh -huh. can you give our listeners sort of an overview of what that looks like? Uh -oh. Unicorn hunters love manic pixie dream girls. Holy hell. Sure. Got it. <laughs> uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> That, that the whole concept of a unicorn hunter feels like it's built around the idea that manic pixie dream girls exist and manic pixie dream girls are a heavily sanitized version of someone's fantasy about you know, dating a, a probably autistic and or ADHD person mostly. So for all that movies featuring manic pixie dream girls aren't usually about non-monogamy, they might as well be because the script is always the same and it's it is really dehumanizing to for to realize that someone is trying to squeeze you into some archetype they think is hot and doesn't seem to be terribly concerned about you, the person. And yeah. that's probably the most common one, and it's definitely the most heavily gendered one. Certainly. Are there any others? I think I mentioned four of them in here. It, the one that is perhaps the most personal for me is this idea that gets aimed at autistic people a lot that we're our emotions are fundamentally inaccessible to anyone else and that we're cold, robotic, reptilian monster people. Therefore, we're too logical to be trusted with, any, with emotional intimacy or obviously we're into something as bizarre as non-monogamy because we're so weird and ro robotic and unemotional. 
as if we're not signing up for dealing with so many more people's emotions this way. It's just, it's contradictory in every way that matters. And at its core is the idea that if someone is neurodivergent, you can think of them as less human and that'll make them make more sense. And it's exactly that sickening. And there's not really a way to deal with a person who thinks that way. If you're lucky, then having a friendship with you will help them realize that, no, no, you're an actual person. You're just different. If someone thinks that about people like you the, and they haven't already reached the, but you're not like that stage and you're not going to get any further with them. It's like I've dealt with so much of that. Like every time I try to assert an unconventional need, I have so many memories of younger me having anything I wanted get dismissed with rhetoric along those lines. Yeah. To go along with that, to start wrapping this up, what are some effective actions that you've seen people take to either make more neurodiversity affirming events and spaces like that, (laughs) or even maybe especially thinking outside of just non-monogamy, but even more generally? A big one is in a big noisy event, have a quiet room. Yes, Mm. amen. Thank Thank you. you. Please. please, There's so... Just about every kind of neurodivergence I can think of, from CPSDSD to borderline autism, ADHD, a bunch more that aren't coming to mind right now. We all appreciate having a chance to get away from sensory overload. Or just not deal mm-hmm. with people for a while. Or or that last presentation was really emotional. We don't feel like crying in public, so we're going to take a break now. And and that space doesn't have to be the bathroom. Like, yeah. Having just a nice, cozy place set aside somewhere for people to, to not be around the hustle and bustle of the event, whatever the topic is, is nice. Uh, those uh, red, yellow, green buttons people can wear based on how what kind of interaction they're hoping for are great. Exactly what each color means depends on what that event is, but having that kind of immediate outward signal that is not nearly as easy to misinterpret as flirting is great. Yeah. Thank uh, goodness. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The, when you were talking about the mm-hmm. quiet space, the term mm-hmm. crying kiosk came to mind. Ooh, I like that. I, like <laughs> so, that. I feel like it's a thing you could maybe market to bring to mm-hmm. events. They're like little individual size, mm-hmm. kind of soundproof booths that you can set up at your event, a little crying kiosk. Well, can we make it more positive, though? Could it be like a comfort kiosk? Because you don't well, have that's to good just too. cry. That's Go and good. cry. Yeah. I don't know. I hear kiosk i think those carts should set up in a mall that have no shelter at all but that's true maybe, yeah, we need it to have be the wrong picture but a, a kiosk is in my right head. right it's gonna be like a nice sheltered comfy uh-huh. space a comfort <laughs> cabana Ooh, I like that. okay <laughs> closer a comfort comfort like comfort quiet cabana quiet uh-huh. comfort uh-huh. cabana Ooh, we're gonna good. work on yeah. it yeah okay we'll, we'll figure it out <laughs> but the top level thing that can be done to make neurodivergent people in general feel good in a space is establish a social norm where if someone is being harmlessly weird you do not be awful to them about it so so much of the nonsense that neurodivergent people deal with is the fact that even people who say they don't have problems with neurodivergent people do not hesitate to make their negative opinion of weird people known and these are heavily overlapping groups it's just a matter yeah. of them not already knowing that a person ha- has a name for the kind of weird they are and the ordinary mainstream thinking that if the kind of weird they are doesn't have a name, it's okay to make fun of them. Yeah, I mean, weird and, can look a lot of different ways and uh-huh. be there for a lot of different reasons. Exactly. That That's interesting to think about spaces where everyone's there together because they're all weird in one context, but then to be shitty to someone who's weird in a different way. Yeah. Exactly. Like, so much of the nonsense furries deal with falls under this kind of category, sure. I think, to say nothing of just how much overlap there is between us and that community. Right. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. True. yeah. Well, Alyssa, this has been a fantastic conversation. Uh-huh. We so appreciate your time. Where can our listeners find more of you and where can they find your book? Uh, can find a- enough of me for a good macro dose at alyssacgonzalez.com. <laughs> Uh, alyssacgonzalez.com you can find my blog at the-orbit.net slash alyssa but there's a link to that at alyssacgonzalez.com you can also buy signed copies of my book there 
If you don't want Ooh. to buy it directly from me, you can go to thornapplepress.ca and follow the links from there. But those won't be signed. Right. <laughs> Very important. <laughs> Not a school. <laughs> Okay, folks. So on our Instagram stories this week, we are going to be posting this question. If you are neurodivergent and also non-monogamous, what would you like to see more of in non-monogamy spaces? We're excited to hear your answers and to repost those to our Instagram. So the best place to share your thoughts with other listeners on this episode is in our episode discussion channel in our Discord server. Or you can also post about it in our private Facebook group. You can get access to these groups and join our exclusive community by going to patreon.com slash multiamory. In addition, you can share with us publicly on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Multiamory is created and produced by Jace Lindgren, Emily Matlack, and me, Dedeker Winston. This episode was researched by M. Mays. Our production assistants are Rachel Shenowark and Carson Collins. Our theme song is Forms I Know I Did by Josh and Anand from the Fractal Cave EP. The full transcript is available on this episode's page on multiamory.com. 